Are we teaching the truth in love? Telling it like it is. Like it is. Like it is. Are we holding pure motives, showing that we care? Are we teaching the truth in love? trio from God, grace, mercy, peace, all coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter number two. I want to read a, a couple of excerpts from chapter number two. Uh, just pluck out three verses that serve as a foundation for the entire chapter. Verse number four verse number 8 and verse number 14. I want you to see these verses because uh, these verses serve as a summary or a survey of the entire chapter of Ephesians chapter number 2. Listen to this. But God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, God is rich. He's rich in a lot of things, but the Bible says here he is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That's verse number eight. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then we want to pluck verse number 14, uh, Ephesians 2, 14. For he is our peace, who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What a marvelous trio this is. Talking about mercy and grace and peace. That's the lesson for uh, this evening as we explore and we examine the book of Ephesians. Let's start with mercy. What a marvelous, what a marvelous blessing mercy is. And we're trying to get a handle on this idea of mercy. I may have told you about uh, a young lady that went to her photographer and uh, he took a series of pictures uh, of her and uh, she went back several days later to review the photos session and review the photos. And she was very unhappy with the pictures that the photographer took and uh, she wouldn't even pay him. And she kept saying, uh, you didn't do me justice. She stormed out of his office and she went across town to another photographer and showed him the photographs that this previous photographer had taken of her. And she just kept saying, he didn't do me justice. He didn't do me justice. And she was angry. And she showed these photographs to uh, this particular photographer that she had gone across town to see. And he looked at the photographs and he looked at her. He looked at the photographs and he looked at her, kept looking back and forth. And he said these words, Madam, you don't need justice. You need mercy. You need mercy. That's my line today. All of us need mercy. We need the mercy of God. And that's what we're talking about on this evening. The mercy of God. The first in this trio is mercy that, that Paul is dealing with here in the book of Ephesians. He writes to the church of Ephesians. He talks about how important mercy is. Oh, mercy. I want you to look at uh, verse number two. 
uh, and three, we're talking about mercy. This is why we need mercy. He writes to the Ephesians, he say these words in uh, verse number two, chapter number two, wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You know who that is? That's Satan. He said, in times past, you walked according to the world. You walked and you acted just like little devils, he, he, he was saying. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He said, at one time, we were all disobedient. And then in verse number three, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. In other words, you were acting just like the world. You were acting like, uh, at one time, you were acting just like the world. Those who were unsaved. That's who you were acting like, uh, Paul says. In other words, we were bad. We were bad. All of us. This is what Paul says. We were bad. We were bad in the sight of God. You know, most of us uh, who are Christians right now, we think that we are, are fairly good. And perhaps we are in our own sight. But the truth of the matter is, if you look in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, in the eyes of God, we are all bad. We are all at the mercy of God. We are, we are bad. And God says this even about our righteousness. He says our righteousness is as filthy rags, even our goodness, even at our best the Bible says, God says, we are like filthy rags. That's what God thinks about our righteousness. But you see, we see ourselves through human lenses. But you know, God sees the heart. Oh, God sees the heart. The Bible says in the Old Testament, Man looketh on the outward appearance. Oh, but God looks on the heart. And God can see your mind and God can see your, your motives. God can read your mind. And what he sees many times is not beautiful. Do you remember that little sitcom back in the 80s, um, Family Matters? Do you remember the star in that particular little sitcom? Uh, his name was Urkel. Urkel was just a weird boy, always doing things crazy, always messing up. I mean, he would just mess up all the time. And when he messed up, he had this line. Did I do that? Do you remember that line? Did I do that? And my friends, I find myself, I found myself in the past doing some things and I just have to look at myself. James, did you do that? Did I do that? Did I say that? Did I think that? Am I by myself? Have you ever been in that situation? You look back at what you did and said, did I do that? Did I say that? Did I think that? And it all talks about how evil we are in the sight of God. Oh, I know that you think you're good and perhaps uh, the world thinks you're good and people think you're good. But God can see your heart and God knows your heart. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And so so God wants us to know that we are not all of that. God wants us to know that because then we are at the mercy of God. You know what mercy is? Mercy is. The love 
the pity, the kindness of God toward our sins. That's what mercy is. And the mercy of God alludes to the idea that God gives us that which we do not deserve. We don't deserve his love and his pity and his kindness because we've been bad boys and bad girls. That's the idea of mercy. God's love and God's pity and God's forgiveness toward our sins. God is a merciful God. And throughout the Bible, God has been merciful to us. Oh, yes, he has. He has been merciful to us. And here in this particular scripture, in verse number four, this is what Paul says again. But God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, God is rich in mercy. He has a lot of mercy. You see, my friends, when God looks at us, he looks at our minds, he looks at our thoughts, and he looks at our uh, motives. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And many times when God looks at our hearts, he can see some things that the world can't see. Sometimes he sees us as robbers. Robbers. Did you not know God says when you don't give to him the way he has blessed you, that, that you, in his sight, are robbers? That's what he told Israel. He says, you have robbed me, this whole nation. You are robbers. And they said, how have we robbed thee? He says, in tithes and in offerings. You ought to read it in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. Will a man rob God? And God looks at us at our motives and our thoughts, and he calls us robbers when we don't give to him the way we should. Not only that, my friends, but when God looks at us sometimes, he sees idolaters. People who are worshiping idol gods. That's what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5. Five, he says, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. To worship material things is just like being an idolater. You are worshiping an idol God. When you worship the things that you have, your money and your material things, God sees that as idolatry. You are worshiping material things. But not only that, sometimes God looks at our hearts and our motives and he sees a murderer. Oh, yes, he does. Because the Bible says this in 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 15. He that hated his brother is a murderer. Did you see that? He that hated his brother is a murderer because murder and hatred are uh, murder is the overt action, but 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 to hate someone is the mental idea because if you keep on hating someone, you can you can be led to murder them. And so God sees our minds. And that's why, my friends, we need the mercy of God. And that's why Paul deals with this idea of mercy. Uh, in this particular chapter, do you remember King David? You ought to read uh, Psalms 118, the whole chapter. King David deals with mercy in that particular chapter. The whole chapter, it's a, it's a short chapter, but he mentions mercy four, five, six times. Oh, God is 
good. His mercy endureth forever. Oh, God is good. His mercy endureth forever. And he kept on talking about God's mercy, God's mercy, God's mercy. You know why? Because David should have been dead. David, King David, should have been stoned because he committed two capital sins. Adultery. That was punishable by stoning. Murder. He murdered them, uh, committed adultery with a woman and then murdered her husband. Two capital sins. But oh, God was gracious. Oh, God was gracious. And God told David, I'm going to spare your life. You will not die. That's mercy. And that's why David kept on shouting throughout the psalm, throughout his life. Oh, God is good and God is mercy. God is good and God is mercy. His mercy endureth forever. He kept on shouting that until the day that he died. What a marvelous blessing mercy is. So, my friends, we need God's mercy because all of us have messed up. Oh, yes, we have. And now let us transition to grace. The second uh, uh, item in this trio, grace. This is what he says in verse number eight. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What a marvelous blessing grace is. Grace, the grace of God. It encompasses two major ideas. First of all, grace encompasses the idea of favor or kindness or love. God's Unconditional love. That's one of the main characters in the uh, in the story of grace. God's unconditional love, God's unconditional favor, God's unconditional kindness. You see, my friends, we're living in a world where people will love you if. People will love you if you are kin to them. You are their brother or sister or mother or father, and uh, they'll love you if you're kin to them. And then there are people that will love you if you have something to offer to them. They will love you as long as you've got something to offer them. They will love you if you got something to offer them. And then there are people that will love you if you love them. Or if you love them, they'll love you to death. They will love you as, as long as you love them. But if you turn on them, they'll turn on you. That's a conditional love. But oh, God's love, God's love, God's grace is unconditional. He'll love you, my friends, if you don't have anything to offer him. He will love you even if you don't love him. He will love you if you are rich and if you are poor. He will love you no matter who you are. God will love you. God's unconditional love. God's grace. That's one of the components of grace. And then the other component of grace is God's amazing ability to forgive. Oh, God, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how God can forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and keep on forgiving. 
No matter how bad we are, God is ready to forgive. No matter what we do, God is ready to forgive. God even forgave those who crucified his son. Oh, what grace that is. To, to forgive someone for killing your own son, that's grace. Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And God forgave them on the day of Pentecost, those same individuals crucified God's son, God forgave them. Those same individuals that crucified Christ, Christ forgave them. Can you see yourself forgiving someone that will kill you or attempt to kill you? That's the grace and the forgiveness of God. That's the love of God. And so therefore, this idea of grace comes up in this particular chapter, for by grace are you saved, through faith, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. And we talked about the idea that don't go bragging about uh, your salvation and don't go bragging about your position in Christ Jesus. Don't go bragging about uh, because the Bible says here, Paul says here in this chapter that we shouldn't boast. That this free will of God, this free uh, gift of God is not of yourself. It's not about you. Not of works, the Bible says, that's in verse number nine, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not about you. It's not about your works. It's not about your goodness. Don't go bragging about what you have and don't go bragging about how much you know. Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Don't go bragging about what you have. Don't go bragging about your abilities and your talent. Don't go bragging about your position. Don't go bragging. Because it's not about you and your salvation, my friends, is really not about you. It's all about God. The mercy of God, the grace of God. That's why you are saved. That's why you're in the body of Christ. That's why you, God has chosen you to be his child because of grace and his mercy. Don't go bragging about your church attendance. Don't, don't go bragging about how much you give to the Lord. Don't go bragging because it's not about you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But let's look at the last part of this, the last item in this trio. It's called peace. I want you to read, I want to read a couple of verses where Paul talks about this peace. Look at verse number 12. And that at that time ye were without Christ, talking about our past, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's talking about our past. Look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you uh, who sometime were afar off, made nigh by the blood of Christ. And finally, look at verse number 14. For he is our peace. That's the word. He is our peace who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Look at the word peace. It means that Christ was our peacemaker. He was our peace sacrifice. He was our peace offering. That is, he has taken the Jew and the Gentile and brought them together. That's what he says. He has, Jesus Christ had broken down the wall of petition between them because that was a great wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And now in the church, Christ has torn down that wall and he has made two one. He has unified the church. 
And that's what God does. God tears down walls between individuals. Oh, God mends relationship. God mends broken relationships. God mends friendships and relationships and, 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 and partnerships and any other kind of ship. God can mend relationships and partnerships and kinships. God can do that. That's called peace. What God does is take the hands of those who were separated and bring those hands together in peace. Take one hand here and one hand there and God takes them and brings about peace. That's what God does. God can bring peace in your family. He can break down the wall that's between you and your husband. He can break down the walls that between you and your children. He can break down the walls that between you and other members of the body of Christ. That's the idea that Paul is trying to bring forth here, that God is, he is our peace. He is our peacemaker. And Jesus said on one occasion, blessed are the peacemaker. And Jesus was the greatest peacemaker that has ever lived. He can make peace. Between individuals, all oh, the peace of God, oh, the peacemaker, that's God. I want to end on this particular note as we look at this. Old King David saw a beautiful sight one day. I'm in Psalms chapter 133 and verse number one. Oh, it was a beautiful, a beautiful sight. So much so, he says, behold, he starts out the chapter by saying, behold, in other words, come here and look at this. The Hebrew word uh, conjures the idea of saying, come here and look at this beautiful sight. Come here. Have you ever seen something that was so beautiful you wanted everybody to see it? Come here, child. Come here. Come here and look at this. What do you see, David? No, it wasn't a beautiful scenery. It wasn't a, a beautiful hillside with beautiful flowers. It wasn't a beautiful waterfall. It wasn't a beautiful sunset. What did you see, David? And no, it wasn't a beautiful woman. David said, I saw this. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh, it's beautiful. I tell you, unity is beautiful. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Look at that verse. First of all, first of all, it says that unity is productive. It's good. It's productive. You can do more together than you can do separated. Oh, how wonderful it is for members of the body of Christ to work together. Oh, how beautiful it is for and productive it is for for members of the family to work together. Uh, father and mother and and husband and wife and children all working together. Have you ever seen a family working together? And oh, what can be accomplished when a family is working together? And oh, what can be accomplished when the church works together? Oh, how beautiful it is. Oh, how marvelous it is. Brethren to work together. Unity. Grace. Mercy. Peace. A wonderful trio. A wonderful trio. It's there for the giving. God offers it to you. All three of these great Blessings God offers to you, grace, peace, grace, mercy, and peace. All you got to do is accept them. That's what he's asking you to do today, friends. Accept the grace. Accept the mercy. Accept the peace. It's yours for the taking. I hope that you have learned something from this message today, and I hope that you are ready to receive the grace 
the mercy and the peace of God. May God richly bless you on today. This is Brother James Gray, the minister of the Eastside Church of Christ. God bless you and God keep you today.